Why does it hurt so badly when you feel rejected? And what can you do about it? I want to talk about that a little bit today. Rejection is such a common occurrence for us, and you know, there's so much room to, be, to feel rejected, even in little ways or big ways, with the people that you know well, your, your family, if you're a student, the people on the playground uh, can, uh, can uh, do something that makes you feel rejected. Uh, people, um, if you're at like a, a tryout for drama or the community play or a baseball team or, or, or a job interview, there's just so many opportunities in life for little and big feelings of rejection. But then when you add to that the whole online community, now there are thousands of opportunities for you every day to feel rejected. You, you may feel rejected when someone um, just uh, like does a thumbs down on, on a post they, they dislike. Or you posted a picture that you were just really hoping all your friends would say, wow, that's so great and no one says anything, it's just silence. That can feel like rejection. Uh, or, or even worse, at the other extreme, when, when someone just gets on uh, your, your social media thread or your feed or your story and, and just starts railing against you and criticizing you, like that really feels like rejection, that hurts. Of course, it hurts even more, like if you get fired, you lose your job. That's a very painful, it feels like rejection. It feels personal. Um, it feels personal when you're abandoned by someone that you love. Or if you're snubbed by your friends, you find out later all your friends went to the concert and didn't even invite you. That feels like rejection. You feel rejected. You might even feel rejected sometimes when you're trying to make a new relationship. I got a little cartoon to show you uh, about that. There's this, this peacock showing off in the restaurant, and these two girl birds say, don't encourage him, Sylvia. Like, don't make eye contact. And the, the poor guy, he's just putting himself out there. He's trying to look as beautiful as he can, getting those feathers, you know, going all colorful, all beautiful. And he just feels rejected by the ladies. Aww. Well, uh, yeah, whether it's minor or major, rejection still hurts. Even the little things that feel like rejection, that hurts. So why does it ruin your mood or, or even damage your self-esteem if you feel rejected? Why, why is rejection such a thing? Like, why does it matter that much? And what can you do about it? Well, we're going to look into God's Word today. If you have a Bible or a Bible on, on a device, would you look at Ephesians chapter 2? Verses 11 to 22. I'm not going to read all of that, but that's kind of the section I'm working from today. Ephesians 2, 11 to 22. And, and we've been looking at ways uh, over these past uh, few weeks, we've been looking at what God's Word says about Jesus' followers, the church. We've called this little series of messages, We Are the Church. Can we say that out loud? We are the church. Well, one more time. We are the church. Yes, the building is not the church. The building is where the church meets. The church also goes out into the community. The church gathers. The church scatters. We are the church, and we're talking about that. And today, I, I, I'm, I'm risking it all here with this title. It's not my usual title style, but here it is. Here's, here's what I want to talk to you about today. Born in Zion. Born in Zion. That's right. What does that phrase even mean? And where does it come from? How does it relate to rejection or to the cure for rejection? Hang, hang in there. Stay tuned. There's more. Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 11. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. Okay, what is a Gentile? Someone who's not a Jew. All right, so that's probably most of us here in, in this room, probably most of us online, maybe not all, but most of us. And Paul is writing to the church, and, and he's saying, hey, remember, you were an outsider. And uh, I'm going to skip down to verse 12. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded 
Someone say excluded. Excluded Excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel. And you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. Listen to this next chilling phrase. You lived in this world without God and without hope. That feels like rejection. (laughs) When you're on the outside looking in and God's people are over there and you're not in that group, that feels like rejection. Well, here's here's the sitch. All humanity had rebelled against God. God, since day one, has been after relationship with you and me. And so in any way that we have walked away from God, that is rebellion against God. And so God was said, I'm not going to settle for that. So he said, I'm going to make a plan to regain your heart and to regain our relationship. And so he, God chose to do it by creating a people, a nation, Israel. And so God decided that he was going to send the Savior of the world through the nation of Israel. And just like they say in fashion, one day you're in, the next day you're out. (laughs) That's right. And so the Israelites were in. They were in for only one reason. God chose them. God chose them. He just decided... I'm gonna, I got to start somewhere to redeem the world, to save the world. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just get a people for myself, and I'm going to bring the Savior of the world to those people. So the Israelites were God's in people, and everyone else were the out people. That's the Gentiles, everyone else. Am I still good? Sound right? Okay. Good. So you and I were born with a red stamp on our forehead that says rejected. It's because all humanity rebelled against God, and God rejected that. He said, I got to start over. And all, the Bible says, all of us have sinned and gone astray. All of us. Rejection of any kind, though, hurts, small or big. And this is kind of a big one. And it, why does it hurt? It hurts because God created something in you, a need, a desire to have relationship. That is from God. You were created for connection. You were created for connection. So you might say, I'm an introvert. Tough noogies, you were created for connection. You might say, I'm an extrovert. I want lots of shallow relationships. Ah, ah, ah. You were created for connection. Everyone, no one gets a buy or a pass on this. You were created for connection. That is how God made you. One time, someone asked Jesus, what's the Bible about anyway? Like, what's the big, most important bottom line of the Bible? Jesus said, it's easy. Love God, love people. Everything else flows out of that. How you act, how you behave, how you, your words, your choices, all of that flows out of love God, love people, because you were created for connection. Yeah. That, is, that is like, that is the whole deal from, from ground zero, from day one. You were created for connection with God and with others. But sadly, we were without God. And we were excluded from the citizenship of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. We were not only rejected by God because of our sin, but we were rejected by the people of God. If you go down through this passage, which I'm not going to read all of this passage right now, it even says the Jews were calling everybody else nasty names. You uncircumcised heathen, that's, that's, what, that's what Paul, that was one of the nasty names that, that they called us. Because they, they, they were in, we were out. We were rejected by the people of God. So the amazing covenant blessings and promises that God gave to Abraham did not apply to us. We were not eligible. They did not, they, we don't get to reap those blessings because we were on the outside. And when you live in the world away from God, excluded from citizenship in his people, well, without God equals without hope. Yeah. Like there's, 
There's nothing to even to live for. There, no purpose beyond this life. And that's why we believe that every person is a candidate for real hope and renewed life in Jesus. We want to see every person find real hope and renewed life in Jesus. But when Jesus came on the scene, even those who were in had a little surprise coming to them. <laughs> the Jews had a little bit of a rude awakening when Jesus, who, who was a Jewish man, he, God became man and he was a Jew. And the Jews were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for this anointed one of God that would come. He had been prophesied and promised. And this is what they were looking for. Someone to come in, be our king, set up an army, defeat the Roman Empire, set us free, and, this is what they were looking for, put the Jewish leaders in places of honor and prominence. That's what they were looking for. That's what they were expecting when the Messiah came. But in Luke chapter 17, verses 20 to 21, it's written down that one day one of the Pharisees, who was a leader, a Jewish leader, asked Jesus, when will the kingdom of God come? Like, you, you're saying you're the Messiah, you're doing some of the miracles we expected Messiah to do, but, but when's the kingdom coming? I want the crown, I want the throne, I want the army, I want freedom from the Roman Empire. When is the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven coming? Jesus replied, the kingdom of God cannot, can't be detected by visible signs. You won't be able to say, it's that building over there. It's over there. It's over here. For the kingdom of God is already among you, or those words can be translated within you. So the kingdom of God is not a physical location. And that's why I try to say over and over and over again, this building isn't the church. This is where the church gathers. So we tend to think that when you die, you'll finally enter the kingdom of heaven. Finally, that's when I'll experience heaven. But Jesus said, you enter it now. Yeah. Now. He said the kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of God is near right now. How do you enter it? Well, Jesus had another conversation with a leader of the Jews in John chapter 3, verses 3 and 5, and, and, and Jesus replied to his questions and said, I tell you the truth, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And the other, the other uh, gospel writers, some say kingdom of God, some say kingdom of heaven. Matthew uh, uh, tended to say God. Here it says kingdom of God. You cannot see the kingdom of God without being born again, without being born of water and the spirit. So the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is not a location. And you don't have to wait to enter it till you die. You enter the kingdom of heaven by a birth. And in fact, it's a rebirth. It is by being born again. That's how you enter the kingdom of heaven. Also, shocker, the kingdom of God is not one ethnicity. Contrary to what the Jews may have believed at the time of Jesus coming. The kingdom of God actually is a people. It's a very diverse people from every tribe, every language group on the planet. That's the kingdom of God. A people all over the world with different languages, different skin tones, different backgrounds, different cultures, all following Jesus, all born again. That's the kingdom of God. So it's not a place. It, you, it, it's, you don't have to wait till you die. It actually comes by birth. And it is a people. It's not just one ethnicity. In that, going back to my main chapter today, Ephesians 2.13, but now you, and we miss this in the English, this word you is plural. But now you all have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you all were far away from God, but now you all have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. He brought this good news of peace. I'm going to skipping down to verse 17. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near to God. 
So Jesus came, and by his blood, he, he brought us into God's presence. We Gentiles were far away from God. We were the out group. We were the not chosen group. But Jesus brought us near to God by his blood. The Jews actually were near, but they were, uh, so many of them, they, they were missing God's presence. And they, were, they were trying to please God, earn God's favor by obeying rules. And both of us were missing it. Jesus brought both of us near. Verse 18, now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. So it is no longer enough to say, I'm a Jew. Me and God, we're good. Just because of my ethnicity, because I'm a descendant of Abraham, that is no longer enough. It's also no longer an excuse to say, I'm a Gentile. I'm not a Jew, so I can't be accepted by God. Neither one of those is true anymore because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 19 now, if you put your faith in Jesus to save you, you're part of the church, all right? So, so Paul is saying to us, so now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You're no longer rejected by God or the people of God. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. Now you are just as chosen as the Jews were. And Jewish uh, people who put their faith in Jesus are just as chosen. And we are together the people of God. As a citizen of God's kingdom, you are accepted. As a citizen of God's kingdom, you are no longer rejected. You are cherished. You are cherished by God. In Jesus you are accepted. You may face 10 feelings of rejection today, small or large. But you know what? It doesn't matter. Because you are accepted by the one who counts. You're accepted. In Jesus, you are accepted. Jesus says, your skin color is beautiful. Jesus says, your heart searching after me is beautiful. Jesus says, your uniqueness is beautiful. Jesus says, you have something to contribute to the church. Jesus says, your youth is not an obstacle. Your elderliness, not an obstacle. You are valued, you are accepted, you are chosen. God speaks your language, God loves you, God is for you, and if God is for you, who can be against you? That's the thing, they can try to be against me, but it doesn't matter, because God is for you. God loves you. Listen to me, you matter. You matter to God. He sees the grief you're going through, and you matter. You matter to God. He knows that mistake you made. He knows that sin you committed. And you still matter. I Many times when I'm just praying, just me and alone with God, I just say, thank you, Jesus, that I was worth it that you would die for me. Now, for me, I don't feel worth it. So that is a faith declaration because I, I'm just going to agree with God's word. And I want you to know today, you were worth it. You were worth it. And I believe on the cross, Jesus saw Tony. And Jesus on the cross goes, man, this hurts. Man, this hurts. My God, why have you abandoned me? Why have you rejected me? Tony's worth it. Tony's worth it. I'm staying here till it's done. Repeat, ditto, super ditto for every one of you. Jesus said, Armando, you're worth it. You're worth it. Diana, you're worth it. Jesus said, you're worth it. I love you that much. I want relationship with you that much. I never wanted you to have rejected on your forehead. That happened because you walked away. <laughs> Jesus said, but I'm coming to you now to scoop you up in my arms and say, I love you. You're beautiful. Come here. Come here. 
That's what Jesus is saying to you today. You are accepted. In Jesus, you are accepted. Ephesians 1.6 is a verse that we, uh, if you've been in the church a while, you've quoted this in another translation. So here's how it sounds in a modern translation. Ephesians 1.6. So we praise God. So, in light of all this, we praise God for the glorious grace, his unearned favor that he has poured out on you who belong to his dear son. It might sound more familiar if I say it in the New King James Version. His grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Have you heard that phrase before? If you've been around for a while, maybe you've heard that, accepted in the beloved. Now, what we tend to think is, oh, accepted in the beloved, that means accepted in the kingdom of God, accepted in the beloved church, accepted in the group. That's not what it's saying. You're accepted in the beloved, in Jesus. Jesus is the one who, when he was baptized in the Jordan River, he comes up out of the river. Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove. A voice of the Heavenly Father shouts down from heaven, This is my beloved Son. Jesus is the beloved he's talking about right here. In Jesus, you're accepted. I know you think you've got some weaknesses, but in Jesus, you're accepted. I know you think you're falling short all the time, but in Jesus, you're accepted. It's like a, a, a young dad whose kids are learning to walk. They're constantly falling. They're constantly bumping into things. They need help constantly. They're scared. They don't want to take another step because they don't know how. And all of that is endearing to their father. He loves every bit of that. He loves the try. He loves your try. Earlier in this service, we, just during worship, we did something not planned at all, very spontaneous, and I didn't even see till right now how that might connect. We tried. We just tried to hear from the Lord, and we tried stepping out. We tried talking in front of everybody. We tried. And I believe that what, right, what was happening in heaven during that moment is that Jesus jumped up out of that throne, was jumping around going, my children are trying. I love that so much. Isn't that cute? Look at how they stepped out. They were so afraid, but they just did a great job. In Jesus you are accepted just as you are. You don't have to try harder to be accepted. He loves you. And I believe that is what God asked me to tell you today. All the other is the structure all around it, but just really this one, one thing that Jesus loves you, accepts you, cherishes you, just as you are. Whew. Jesus himself was despised and rejected so that you can be accepted and cherished. Jesus was rejected so you can be accepted. Jesus was rejected so you can be accepted. Him facing that rejection bought your acceptance. His blood was spilt. He laid down his life so you could have eternal life. When you feel the sting of rejection in your life, you can rest in this truth. In Jesus, you are accepted. In Jesus, you are accepted. You are fully accepted in the beloved Jesus. You are embraced by the Father. I'm not going to have time today to talk about what born in Zion means. Come back next week. We'll see if I can work it in. We're going to move into a time of communion. 
And so ushers, would you just come on down real quickly and just make sure everyone's got the uh, uh, bread and the cup. So maybe you have, you might have already gotten one, but if not, catch your attention real quick and, and uh, let's, let's get you one so that everyone can participate. So now what we're about to do, I, 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 I don't want you to miss this. What, what we're about to do in, in communion is this is a symbolic meal for those in the kingdom of God. You know how a postage stamp, uh, some of you might remember those, a postage stamp is a symbol. And, and uh, maybe just hold on to your bread and juice, if you would, for just a moment. The, a postage stamp is a symbol of a lot of things. It's a symbol of the money you paid to buy that stamp. It is a symbol of the authority of the U.S. Postal Service to deliver that. It's, it's, it's a symbol that, that that letter, that card is protected. It's a little tiny, thin stamp. It's only like that, that thick. It's a, but it is a symbol of something so much greater. And uh, you guys, why don't you go ahead and just put on, uh, put on some light music back there, and, and we'll just kind of begin to set a mood for this. Um, this little tiny bread, in finger quotes, it's a symbol. This juice is a symbol of something a lot bigger. This is a meal, when you put this together in this context, this is a meal for those who are in the kingdom of God. That's what this is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 24 to 26, Paul wrote, he's reminding us what Jesus said. And Jesus said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So this is a symbol. This is not Jesus' body. This is a symbol for us of his body. And it reminds us of him. He said, do this in remembrance of me. So Jesus gave his body. He was beaten. Could you just break that? He was beaten so that you could be whole. And the word is sozo. It's one word that uh, it's translated uh, three different ways, depending on just on the context and what was being happening at the time. Saved, healed, delivered. Saved, healed, delivered. Saved, healed, delivered. Jesus' body was beaten so you could be sozo, so you could be saved, healed, and delivered. Jesus said this cup is the new covenant. Where have we heard that word today? We were outsiders from the covenant blessings. God said, I'm making a covenant with you, Abraham. I'm going to bless the whole world through you. But we, it didn't apply to us because we were outsiders. But now, Jesus said, I'm making a new covenant. And you're included. You're accepted. Wow. Jesus said, this is the new covenant between God and his people. It's an agreement confirmed with my blood. This covenant was very expensive. It came at the price of Jesus' blood. And Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. Jesus shed his blood for you so you could be whole. Sozo is the, the underlying word. Saved, healed, delivered. That's what God's plan is for you. And this blood confirms it. Verse 26, for every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're doing two things. You are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. And you're looking up. You're looking back. Thank you for your death. And you're looking ahead because Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. Don't forget that, church. Jesus is coming again for you. And if you put your faith in Jesus, you're in the kingdom of God. So this meal is twofold. 
It is a celebration of what Jesus did and what he accomplished. And it's an anticipation that Jesus is coming again. So many times we sort of traditionally have made this like somber and depressing. It is depressing to think that Jesus hung on a cross. That's horrible. But it's also an anticipation that he is no longer dead. And he's coming back. He promised, I'm coming back for you. You're bringing him back. You're the reason. He wants to come back and be united with you and get some kingdom business done. I love it. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly. We're ready to see you. We want to see you. We're waiting, watching. We're working on your mission till you come. Amen? Amen. Now, if you have not yet put your faith in Jesus, you're still on the outside. But Jesus doesn't want you there. He paid the highest price to get you on the inside of the church. Capital C, worldwide, followers of Jesus Christ. Not just our little congregation. It's the followers of Jesus Christ. You don't have to be outside. You can be inside. How do you do that? Put your faith in Jesus. All your trust in him. I'd love to lead you in a prayer. Would you just bow your heads? And if you need to give your life to Jesus Christ today, you want to become a Christian, would you just raise your hand in the room or online? Pray this prayer after me. And church, let's help them out. Jesus, I invite you into my life. I acknowledge I'm a sinner, rejected, stamped on my head. And I ask you, please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I want to be in your church, your kingdom not out. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer, you have begun. You are now in. Not because you did a bunch of work or tried really hard, but because Jesus gave his life for you. So let's celebrate. Let's anticipate. Let's celebrate what Jesus did, but let's also anticipate his coming. Would you stand to your feet and just yeah, have your communion there ready? And let's pray. Lord Jesus, first we celebrate. We celebrate what you did for us. You gave your life. You allowed your body to be beaten and pierced. You shed your blood also that we could be saved, healed, and delivered. And I thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, I am saved, healed, delivered. And we just say that around this room and online. In Jesus' name, I am saved, healed, and delivered. And now, Lord, because of that, we're looking forward to your return. Come back. Come, Lord Jesus. And when you come, we will be waiting, we will be watching, and we will be working. We will be doing your work on the earth in the kingdom of God, and we will actually be spreading the kingdom of God. We will be bringing the kingdom of God into our workplace, our school, our neighborhood, our families. Because we are saved, healed, and delivered, we want everybody else to be also. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so now this is not somber. Let's eat this and realize, wow, just as physical as this bread is, Jesus is coming back. And you know what his first words are going to be? You got anything to eat? He loves to eat with his people. Like every time. Let's eat together. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. We're eating with you now. I cannot wait to eat with you. What do you like to eat, Jesus? I want to eat it with you. I want to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb with you, with the church. Gather together. Let's drink together. In the assemblies of God, we don't really do much alcohol. But I hear up there we get some good wine. I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be awesome. It's going to be a celebration. It's going to be food, drink, and joy in the presence of Jesus. Amen? Amen. All right. If you only remember one thing, remember this. In Jesus, you're accepted. As you are. In Jesus, 
you're accepted. Woo! Can we just give God a shout? Amen. Amen. Praise you, Jesus. Thanks, Pastor Garrett. In Jesus, we are accepted. In Jesus, we are accepted. Take that to heart. Oh, man, so good. Well, at this time, if you did fill out those um, Connect cards, please drop them in the little box in the back. And we'll collect those and, and pray for you throughout this week as well as connect with you. Um, at, oh, yeah, and if you did, if today was your day and you are now a new believer of Jesus, please stop by the Following Jesus booth in the lobby. I will be there, and um, we'll get you an awesome swag bag, get you started on this, this amazing path of how to follow Jesus. We want to equip you with that. We want to empower you for that. Also, if anyone is interested in volunteering for helping with our remodel, if you're even like vaguely interested, please stay after service. We're going to have a super brief meeting um, after service, talk about what needs to be done before Easter and in the next coming months. Please stay after, hear what needs to be done, and, and please fill up the fr front three rows. The back, like eight rows, those are anathema. Those are awful. Don't touch them. <laughs> the first front three rows so we don't have to be miked. All right. We love you guys. God bless you. See you next week.